It's coastal race day, it's day number two, sun is shining here in uh, Croatia, the uh, breeze is uh, expected to be up to 13 or 14 knots. It's a great challenge for this is the first coastal race ever in Croatia, lots and lots of islands uh, in the course, lots of opportunities for snakes and ladders and a great race in prospect. Yeah, one move has to lead to the next move, so you round one point but that has to set you up for the next, the next point that you go to, so um, it's thinking bigger term. It's a whole new venue for, for pretty much everyone here, so it's going to be a little bit of a make it up as you go, which uh, always makes it very interesting for us as tacticians and strategists to, to try and predict what we think's ahead of us. Well, just as in any top Grand Prix sport, there is a transfer market for championship winning talent. Look at Vasco Vascotto, headhunted from Azura to Luna Rossa. I'm just a lucky guy. It's not a matter of money. I promise you that. Uh, is uh, more or less the same. <laughs> so as we head out in this coastal race today, around about 30 miles in through some of the most beautiful cruising grounds and the busiest cruising grounds in Europe, it's a chance to enjoy the scenery but also to reflect we have to look after our playground. first coastal race of the season gets off with a good forecast, a very light sea breeze on the start line and a course setting out through the islands, five to seven knots on the start line. Pretty uneven pressure at the start, more on the left at the pin end of the line. That's what uh, Luna Rossa obviously liked, they get away nicely. Quantum Racing are over the start line and are recalled and are really on the back foot from there. Sled or bounce Azura off and then take control of the right side of the track early on along with uh, Pat Preck. At the top mark, uh, Platoon go round in seventh, Quantum Racing round in eighth and Luna Rossa back in last place. Thereafter is breaking out through the islands into the stronger sea breeze, building quite nicely. Up the long beat, it's a case of uh, staying close to the island shore, working the shore. Sled extend and extend, Paprek go with them. And really it's down the runs where the gains are made. Platoon make a nice uh, advance from seventh to fourth down the uh, long run. Gladiator lose a place or two, but it's a long race and at the finish line it's Sled in first, Paprek second, Platoon get up to third and take the regatta lead. It was a leader's race, once you're ahead it was quite easy, all the boats behind were fighting with each other and we were able to just sail away to a huge victory. Nice environment but exhausting I tell you. I mean warm and with this wind shifts and these conditions uh, to concentrate like four hours in a row that's tough. Yeah, it's a great pleasure because the weather was fine, the paysage was fantastic and uh, we were second. And it was key for me because you know I acquired new boats, not a brand new like the others, but uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, but with my team, was it a good idea or not? And uh, I can confirm it was a good idea. So after the coastal race, Platoon leading on eight points, five points up on Quantum Racing, third Onda on 14 points, just one point behind Quantum. Well, warm temperatures, 30 miles of picture postcard racing, a classic Croatian coastal race and sled coming out on top. Join us again as we go back to reality and back to Windward Leeward Racing. Yes, I promise this. <laughs> this night we are going to drink a lot of champagne. <laughs>
Well, the incredible pictures at the moment from the helicopter just uh, taking off and coming over the boats from Cardiff, the lights from the ribs, illuminating Team Brunel in the gloom. We've also got the stern camera at the moment, and I think that's uh, Andrew Cape just wandering around at the back, and it looks like almost a full complement of crew up on the deck. Right now, we are into that final push, the last few moments of leg nine. The two Dutch boats have been battling it out for the last few days. And as you say, with record-breaking speed runs as well. It's been incredible that Team Axe and Abel have been sailing Oops. so fast. And then Team Brunel alongside them as well. This could be the last uh, tack that they've been going through here to get through to the line. Team Brunel, the boards come down and they tack the boat through. We are expecting them to come through the line in any moment. But it looks like just two short tacks to go and with a quite a lot of tide at the moment. And interesting that the tide, we were worried about it compressing everybody. Actually, it's held these two Dutch boats clear of Dongfong Race Team. It's held them clear of Vestas 11th Hour Racing. They've been able to keep moving while the other boats have been held up. That's right. It's all about picking your spot to have, um, to have your slowdown. And actually, if you look back on the tracker on the website at the moment, if, uh, if you're following along, and you will see that they ground to a halt and did a bunch of short tacks up on the northern coast. That's where the, um, there are a bunch of sandbanks up there. And when you've got the tide against you, then you want to be in the shallower water possible. Because in the deep water, that's where the tide is flowing fastest. So if it's against it, you need to get up onto the coast and away in shallow water. So that's what they did very successfully. And whereas the other boats that were chasing them down were caught mid-flow. Uh, having the worst of um, of the current pushing them back out the, out the other way. So, um, so actually, it, it sort of happened at a good moment for them that they were already close to the coast when um, when the worst of the current hit them, and they were able to sort of take shelter in amongst the sandbanks. And they would have been planning this for days, for weeks, for months. I mean, as soon as Cardiff was announced as a stopover, the one thing you do is you start getting out your tide atlas and you start learning that stretch of water because we know that leg nine was going to be very tricky towards the finish. We knew that this was going to be challenging. Bauer Becking and Team Brunel have played this beautifully. So have Team Axe and Abel. But sadly for Simeon Team Point, just shy of what Bauer Becking has been able to do. We've got the helicopter up and hovering over the top of Team Brunel. We've got some spectators out there on the water welcoming the Dutch boat to be the first team to cross the line here at the close of leg nine. And this is crucial for Bauer Becking in terms of points as well. This means, in a few moments, they're going to cross the finish line. The bonus for the win, double point leg, they are well within chance of winning the Volvo Ocean Race. That's right, not just the leg, but the entire Volvo, Volvo, Volvo Ocean Race uh, in the overall. So this is incredible. And, and you know, what a charge back onto the podium and then now to threaten for the overall. But remember, they take this lead now. Were it not for Matt Frey's incredible come from behind victory in the previous leg, this would have been three on the trot for them. And so no other team in this race has, um, has been on the top two steps so reliably. Even Matt Frey early on. Uh, or even reliably. And, and so it's, it's absolutely incredible. This is the return to the form that we expected from Bauer back in when he joins up uh, in this leg. And uh, now that they've crossed the line and they can drop the sails, you know, they've, they've got that win in the bag. It's going to be absolutely fascinating uh, to see how the rest of the fleet come across the line and the way that the points finally shake out. There, you could have forgiven the naysayers for believing the Bauerbeck and when he was talking about we could still win it from here. No, that's just the skipper trying to, trying to raise the morale of the crew. But right now, with two short legs remaining in this edition of the Volvo Ocean Race, Team Brunel have every reason to celebrate, every reason to smile. By our calculation, it looks like they are going to be just three points away from the top spot in the overall scoreboard. Two short legs, plenty of points on offer, Bauer Becking has raised his game and Team Brunel can hold their hopes high. There is every chance that we could see the yellow boat lifting the trophy in The Hague for winners of the overall Volvo Ocean race. It's going to be close. Dongfeng Race Team, Map Rate, they are going to hang on by their fingernails. But what an unbelievable last few legs for Team Brunel. And a great scorecard. Nearly, shall we say, a perfect scorecard. They only narrowly missed out 
on the winning the last leg by what, 61 seconds? <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I'm sure that Baalbekin will be ruined that moment and those uh, extra bonus points uh, that they lost going into Cardiff as well, but, uh, into Newport, excuse me. Uh, because had they had those extra two points, then that would have put them almost in first place right now. Well, celebrations for Team Brunel. The sails down, the boat making its preparations to come ashore. We're going to hear from the sailors shortly, but out on the water, we do have Team Max and Abel in second place, very, very close behind, the second of our Dutch boat. And of course, as you were saying, now the new record holder for the 24-hour Volvo Ocean Race record. They're going to be coming across the line and uh, they're going to be the first person to congratulate Team Brunel. And there you can see Team Axe and Abel coming in now underneath the line. It was incredibly close between these two. Simeon Team Point would have been, would have been heartbreaking to see those last few miles and unable to reel Team Brunel back in. Well, yesterday, um, a little bit less than 12 hours ago, I did a, um, a live interview with the two skippers and they had the opportunity to talk directly to each other um, via the magic of, of Inmarsat and the... And the but, um, you know, Simeon Tenpont was still feeling pretty bullish, although he could have had the opportunity to talk directly to, uh, to Bauer Becken because during the course of the night they did close up. They got to, you know, less than 0.1 of a mile separating the two boats. Uh, in terms of distance to finish. This was almost their leg as well, and you've really got to feel for them. You know, the, this was a team that, that struggled early on as, and has lately sort of returned to form, um, but this leg was almost theirs as well. Almost theirs, the points almost theirs. They were almost closing up to that podium, but now Team Axel Abel are coming across the line. Second place, it wasn't the result that only a few hours ago was on the cards. However, still a very strong finish for Simeon Team Point and the crew of Team Axenabel. They, true, are looking very strong at the moment on the water. It's unbelievably close at the moment on the overall rankings. Such depth of skill throughout the entire fleet. A second place finish for Team Axenabel as they cross the line here to draw leg nine to a close for them. And, of course, the realization that they have now sent the bar for the 24-hour record in the Volvo Ocean Race. An incredibly high bar of that, over 600 miles sailed in 24 hours. to the J0 and uh, the waves are quite messy a little bit so it's just sorting everything out and get ready to go back on the bank for a two hour nap. <laughs> yeah so we're just in the last of the really nice stuff where we've just been sending it in 30 knots, easy miles and by tomorrow lunchtime it's like going to hit a brick wall. We're going to go from 30 knots to nothing. And we've got this big ridge to cross. And at the moment I'm trying to look and find out where we're going to cross it. And the models don't really agree. And what we want to do is try and be clever so that we can catch up some of the mileage that we've lost to the others. It's just giving me brain ache at the moment. The Cunningham uh, broke the strap that comes out of the cell. So we're trying to fix it and use the, the second one. Do I enjoy it? Yeah, it's good. It's nice to have a bit of breeze. Um, yeah, I think we've all been waiting for this breeze to come. Um, we've said a few days of very light winds a couple of days back. Um, but this has been the breeze we've been wait waiting for for a while and it should take us most of the way there. So, um, Cardiff, here we come.
So it's a beautiful, clear, and sunny day where Sasha and I are on board Sophisticated Lady at anchor in Grenada. We're going about our morning rituals when about 9, 10 in the morning we hear a distress call come in over the radio. We're pulling engine up. I need somebody just to keep an eye in front of us. We're going to see if we can get in on this green area or if it's too shallow. It's fairly garbled and sounds a little panicked, but somehow we make out boat and reef. And then after a little bit more chatter back and forth between other cruisers, we also make out Hog Island and Secret Harbor. And we're anchored in Secret Harbor, so we knew there must be a problem with somebody on the reef in our proximity. They were calling for assistance from any dinghies in the area, and we had a Yamaha 60 horsepower, so I knew we'd have enough power to help. The main thing we were going to need was going to be a long, Thank flexible you. line to use as a tow rope to try and pull the boat off the reef. Seems to be moving. So I told Sasha to grab our dinghy tow line because it's 100 feet long and made of three strand twists, so lots of flex in it. So she got the line ready, I got the dinghy ready, we grabbed our radio and off we went. We made our way out of the anchorage and it didn't take long to spot the boat. It was still under full sail trying to heel its way off the reef. But as we got closer we could see he was hard aground on top of the rocks. He wasn't going anywhere anytime soon. Now our next problem was just going to be getting close enough to actually assist. We were surrounded by rocks shallower than our depth in the dinghy so we had to be very careful. There was a lot of waves and current pushing us around and it was very hard to get anywhere even close to the boat without endangering our own dinghy. This is going to be the problem. Sounds like we might have a language problem. Yeah. But if we can get one of his halyards and give it to this guy, he'll have enough power to pull the boat over a little more. But we got to watch we don't sink him by pulling over too far. And then we get on the front and pull him forward by the bow. Yeah, his, his rudder is almost out of the water, so he doesn't have any. Uh oh. We passed it? We need a tune now. Yeah, he doesn't have much more room to pull over. Yeah, we got to get him off that for sure. Um, okay, we need to start rigging our tow rope. Sasha. And that was the end of our Sony camera, so we had to switch over to the GoPro with no audio. So we continue on and we're battling the reef and the waves and the current, and we managed to get around the bow and trying to get this line hooked up onto something substantial enough on his boat that we could pull it without actually ripping a fitting right out of his deck. After many attempts, I realized even with a 100 foot line, we did not have enough line to actually successfully pull him off. We could not stay in a straight line and we kept pulling sideways towards the rocks and had to back off and then go full circle all the way around again just to realign ourselves. It wasn't too long after a bunch of other dinghies showed up and luckily some of them brought some lines as well. So then our thought was if we could string together enough of the lines and extend it out past the reef, we could put it onto one of the boats that had substantially more power than we did and let them pull from safely outside the reef.
Oh, there was somebody else. current it gives you a good push and, uh, and a little bit of extra boat speed um, but uh, as you can see at the moment probably from how the camera shaking around that uh, it also kind of messes up the sea state a little bit so it's yeah it's a pretty cool phenomenon the Gulf Stream apart from saving Europe from being a frozen icy tundra it uh, yeah also gives us a lot of uh, a lot of current to play with when we're racing it starts off actually in the Gulf of Mexico hence it's called the Gulf Stream it flows all the way up the uh, the east coast of the United States, out uh, out across into the Atlantic, and uh, yeah, actually the, the tail of the Gulf Stream can be felt right now. We're way out, sort of to the east of uh, Newfoundland, Nova Scotia. So it's uh, yeah, several thousand miles long. Because sea surface temperatures all over the world are rising, there's less of a temperature gradient between the Gulf Stream and the rest of the ocean. So therefore, the uh, Gulf Stream is actually slowing down, uh, and it's not pulling water out of places like Narragansett Bay, Chesapeake Bay, and that's one of the reasons that um, we're expecting to experience such sea level rise, you know, in the next 10, 20, 50, 100 years. One of those horrible days where you, you head out. The forecast hasn't been looking good, but you hope there's some wind out there. There wasn't. The race officer was very enthusiastic and, and desperate to try and achieve what what he's out there to achieve, which is, you know, a credit to the organisers, I guess. You know, it's, it was light and it was shifty, and uh, we tried our best, but we weren't on the right side of everything, I don't think, today. It's fun, it's really good to come to a new location, it's fun to sell somewhere different. I think the, 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 the combined yacht clubs with Paul that have put the event on have done really well to get this organised, get all the boats in the same marina and organise, you know, what what yesterday was some absolutely superb racing with great conditions, you know, and, and today was, was it was good racing but just in frustrating conditions. In all honesty, Matt, in the light wind stuff, I, uh, I'm downstairs, so I don't get to see a lot of what's going on upstairs but I've got my new watch so I know what the splits are. Jubilee, she's always been a quick boat in the light. Um, and uh, I mean, Zephyr being, being uh, 42 foot long, you know, the grandfather GP42s will always do uh, slightly better, I think, in the light. Tokolosh, I think, in that second race, had a, a, a pretty good race. I think Pace had a really good day with two solid thirds. Jubilee, I think, was you know, in the first race they were chomping at the back of round, which is, you know, really great. Um, I mean, round's just exceptionally quick, you know, the next generation boat leaps ahead and, you know, we've just got to keep on the tail end of them, keep applying pressure. I think Rebellion had a bit of a shock in the first race and had a blinding second race with an outright win. A big mention has to go to Ant O'Leary, who who's done a fantastic job today, he did a really good job yesterday, you know, we had a few hours training on Friday in not really ideal conditions, but Ant's really, really stepped up to the mark and done exceptionally well. It's 
great to see see Morty down here. Um, it, it'll be it'll be better when we see him back on the boat. So it's such a shame he can't sail, but it's so fantastic that the program still continues. I had a fun day. If you can't have a fun day, then you know what can you have? You, you win some, you lose some, and you take the rough with the smooth. Just had a pretty, pretty big watch, I've got to say, 35 to 40 knots. Had the day zero on, and I don't know, I don't, I don't know if my eyes look bad, but they feel like there's been a handful of gravel rubbed in them. Um, just got the helmet on towards the end, it made it a little better, but then, you know, you've got such restricted visibility, you don't know, really, um, at times you don't know where you're going. But really cool. Like that's some of the best best sailing you get to do. Was, uh, earlier it was flat water in 35 knots. The boat's been sitting on 26, 27 knots constant pace, and just that's cool. And it's so you know hardly anyone ever gets to do that. And it's quite a uh, quite a privilege to give it a crank for a couple of hours. Uh, now the sea's picking up a bit. Uh, we're still sort of neck and neck with Vestas Brunel. Uh, no one's no one's given an inch, so uh, we just keep keep pushing hard. The boat's safe, everything's good. So uh, breeze breeze should die off soon. We'll get back on the big gear and keep pushing. Over. I broke the 600 miles per year in a day, 24 hours, and uh, really stoked for that. Last record uh, in the Volusion race had been for my father, so uh, <laughs> now we have uh, some things to talk on the dinner table. <laughs> but uh, yeah, super happy for the whole crew and uh, that we still can push hard and the boat is all good. Um, I mean, I'm pretty sure he will be happy for us, uh, but I'm not sure about uh, taking his record. <laughs> Let's see. A gente acabou de quebrar o recorde de, de 24 horas. A gente fez mais de 600 milhas náuticas. E o último recorde na regata era do meu pai. E, uh, então, eu estou super feliz pela tripulação toda, que a gente está todo mundo ainda em um pedaço. Mas foram uh, duras 24 horas de muita onda aqui. State, relatively speaking, so you know it's good speeds, not huge nose dives, but certainly very wet and uh, good fun. fast in these reaching conditions so I think we're just happy to hang on at the moment and wait for our time later down towards the, towards the finish. 